Let's give her a big. Make sure you take some home because, like I said, there is a ton of food there. And I'd like to thank uh, Janelle and Paula, who they're doing a recording and a documentary. But um, if you have any questions, please, any questions about I'm told to get yourself a donor and become comfortable with the process. So every question is a good question. So we're going to know if you can do Right. Hello, everyone. And thanks for being a part of today's presentation and for taking the initiative to come again and learn about the opportunity that One Health Conversation has to rightly receive the recognition and authority to manage the lands and resources within the balance. Yeah. Um, So today we're going to familiarize ourselves uh, with a couple of the pieces that work together to create these opportunities. And then we'll be here in second with Al Gross, who is the independent verifier, and Jackie Brown, who is the land code governance advisor with the Lands Advisory Board and Resource Center. Um, and the Lands Advisory Board and Resource Center is a resource that was created by and composed of First Nations that are operating under land to assist with nations who are um, going to go on their own land codes. So for those of you who don't, my name is Louis Cornish. I was born and raised here in Wilson. Um, and now I am the land code coordinator. And because your questions might get answered throughout the presentations, I'm going to have to save any questions for the open discussion. So there's pens and papers here. If you want to write down any questions you have um, or whatever gets written in the chat, uh, we'll address in the open discussion. So we might as well jump right in and I'll do a recap on to this stage with land code. So back in December of 2014, Chief and Council signed a band code council resolution that confirmed that Port Nelson First Nation desired to be a signatory to the framework. So the framework agreement is a First Nations-led uh, land management initiative that withdraws the reserve lands and resources from Canada's control under the Indian Act and gives the legal authority to the nation to manage the reserve land and resources under a land um, this transfer of administration and management does not affect any inherent Indigenous or treaty rights and freedoms. Um, then in May of 2016, Fort Nelson First Nation became a signatory to the Framework Agreement and work continued to create the, uh, the first version of the land code uh, document by that's tailored to the community by the community. So this included Fort Nelson First Nation community members, staff, council, as well as First Nation lawyers, and the First Nations led land advisory board and resource center. In June of 2018, the first vote was held, and that vote required two thresholds in order to pass. The first threshold was simply more yes votes than no votes. And then the second threshold was 25% of eligible voters had to vote yes. So although more voters did vote in favor of land code, it was 28 votes shy of that second threshold. Six months later, there was an amendment to the framework agreement that actually removed that second threshold. Um, you know, it was that threshold was not really fair, right? Like you don't have to have a certain amount of voters to hold in the finance or or three years. So why did you have to have a certain amount of voters for this? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so had the vote actually happened six months later, um, Fort Nelson would have already been operating under the land. 
um, without the restriction of Canada's involvement uh, on user lands and places. After that vote uh, didn't pass because of that second threshold, in January 2020, Chief and Council passed a DCR to re engage FNFN members as well as review and update the necessary documents that are required under the framework for a second vote. Now, throughout the pandemic, it ultimately ran into a number of challenges and delays, which brought us to this spring. When, and as Leslie mentioned, I've been heavily invested in everything uh, ready to properly inform the membership on what a yes vote online code could mean for the community now and in the future. One thing that I worked really hard on updating was the website. We created a number of um, video presentations on the website that you can watch anywhere. If you have headphones, you can put, put them in, wash your dishes, whatever. Um, we're going to watch two of those right now. Uh, familiarize ourselves with the website here. Um, so to me, this is a really important website. And so it's, it has everything that you need to know about. It has the actual land code document and then the individual agreement. These two documents is what will be voted on. Background documents are summaries, the maps of the reserve lands, because again, it, it has nothing to do with Treaty 8 territory. It is only the boundaries within the reserve lands. Um, the community ratification document, which is the process on how the vote is to be held. And then the framework of this. So this here is the home page when you come to fnfmlandco.com. And if you scroll down here, that's where you're going to find these video resources. Um, so we're going to watch two today. This one here is only 10 minutes. And then the one below here is seven minutes. This one is an introduction to the framework agreement and the land code document. And then the other one is about the individual agreement. So those are really like the three, three important pieces of the puzzles. So we'll go ahead. This presentation on the framework agreement on First Nation land management and land code. Today, we're going to discuss the factors of uh, framework agreement that aim to empower First Nations communities with self government and land management. We'll start with an introduction to the framework agreement, which was originally signed in 1996. It's a historic and groundbreaking initiative, and it seeks to address the historical injustices and challenges uh, faced by First Nations communities, where limited decision making power and federal control over the lands really stifle a lot of progress. The framework agreement represents a significant step towards rectifying these issues and building a more equitable future. So, a little bit about we must understand the historical context to appreciate the importance of this agreement. For generations, First Nations community faced colonization, displacement, and the imposition of federal policies that dictated their lives. And the framework emerged from the determination of over a dozen First Nations to reclaim their rights, culture, and land stewardship. As of 2023, there are over two and over a hundred of those are having votes in operation, operation includes in force. So the purpose of the framework agreement at its core is to foster self-determination for First Nations. It grants them the authority to exercise self-governance over their lands, resources, and decision-making processes. By doing so, the rates of Indigenous peoples and contributes to the broader rule of reconciliation between First Nations and Canada. So two key components of the framework agreement. To understand the full scope of this transformative initiative, we must examine two the framework agreement 
this nationwide engagement and the living movement. These components together empower participating host nations to chart their own course of government free from the constraints of outdated and paternalistic or parent-like policies. The Framework Agreement on First Nation Land Management was enacted in 1999, and it marks a turning point in the relationship between First Nations and the Canadian government. Through participating communities gain the authority to develop and implement their own rules. This legal framework empowers First Nation communities to make decisions regarding and related laws within their communities. Ensuring that decisions are made with the communities that's interested. Land, the heart of self governance and participating first nations. It is not a one size fits all solution. Instead, each community has the opportunity to develop its own, tailored to its unique cultural, environmental, and economic needs. This approach recognizes the diversity among First Nations and allows them to assert their cultural identity and values in their systems. Now, the list of benefits is much longer than this, but benefits of the framework agreement are reaching and profound for the participating First Nations. With greater control over lands, resources, and decision making processes, these communities can foster cultural preservation. And economic development. More, the agreement reduces Canada's authority and management and grants First Nations control over the capital and revenues held by Canada, removing bureaucratic barriers and empowering them to leverage their own lands finances. Funding agreements from Canada are in place to support the transition to as well as mechanisms to create accountability and transparency between the chief and council and administration and the membership. Another massive benefit to the framework agreement is the jurisdictional power First Nation receives regarding reserve. Now, one of the most remarkable aspects of the framework agreement is its emphasis on the community-based decision-making processes. First Nations have the authority to create their own incorporating traditional knowledge, cultural practices, and community aspirations. This inclusive ensures that decisions are made collectively with a deep understanding of the community's history, values, and aspirations for the future. Language, which is a key aspect of the brain, means participating First Nations can now engage in comprehensive learning aligning with their cultural and interests. This shift from rigid federal regulations to community-based allows for a more sustainable development that respects economic viability, ecological integrity, and cultural significance. Environmental stewardship. The framework Stewardship as a cornerstone of responsible land management. Participating First Nations are now in a position to implement sustainable practices, protect lands, waters, and resources, and integrate traditional ecology into decision making processes. This approach fosters a harmonious relationship between First Nations and the natural environment, safeguarding for generations to come. Economic opportunities. The framework agreement brings with it a wealth of economic opportunities for participating First Nations. By exercising natural resources, communities can pursue various ventures in tourism, renewable energy project, projects, forestry, agriculture, resource development. Um, these opportunities generate jobs, revenue, and ultimately lead to a greater self-sufficiency and prosperity for communities that choose these paths. Jurisdiction and governance. So <clears throat> the aspect of the agreement, agreement is transformative on multiple levels. The agreement facilitates the transition from federal control to self-governance, placing decision-making authority directly in the hands of First Nations communities. 
This transfer of power not only strengthens the jurisdictional rights of First Nations, but also paves the way for effective governments tailored to the unique needs of each. It solidifies the legal authority for a nation to enforce its own laws, which can include their justice of peace and creating a court dispute resolution processes. Impact on Indigenous rights. The framework agreement is a milestone in advancing Indigenous rights. Along with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the agreement sets a powerful precedent in recognizing and protecting the rights of Indigenous peoples. Importantly, it does not impede Treaty 8 rights nor restrict future negotiations, but rather acts as a platform for strengthening Indigenous rights within reconciliation. Legal and policy framework. To ensure the smooth implementation of the framework agreement, it operates within a robust legal and policy framework. The land code, along with other relevant legislation and policies, guides the implementation of the agreement's principles, processes, and procedures. This ensures that the transition to self-governance is well supported and grounded in legal legitimacy. Future perspectives. The future of the framework agreement is incredibly possible. As more First Nations choose to participate, the agreement's reach will expand, driving even greater increase in self governance, land management, and economic change. The continued growth of the agreement will foster self sufficiency, cultural preservation, and the strengthening of Indigenous rights. This bodes well for the long term well being of First Nations communities and the nation as a whole. So, in conclusion, the free freedom of First Nation language and represents a historic and transformative step towards self governance and the language management for participating First Nations. The agreement empowers communities by granting control over lands, resources, promoting economic development, and preserving cultural heritage. It is a testament to the resilience and determination of Indigenous peoples to reclaim their rightful place in shaping their own destinies and building a greater future. If you have any questions on the all, please reach out to me, building.org at or give me a call at the Lens Building, or you can actually check out the website as well, www. F N F N Thank you. I said land but I'm turning to Then if we can watch the um no, no, the next one I tell to this person. This down, don't get done down. One more time. Please, our individual hand. Oh, that's better. Thank you. Hello. To this presentation on the individual agreement on First Nation land management. What else in First Nation wants to have the opportunity to control? the governance, management, and administration of its reserved lands. As part of the process to get control, First Nation worked with Indigenous Services Canada to develop the individual agreement along the First Nation language path. The individual agreement explains how reserved lands will transfer from Canada to Fort Nelson First Nation. It is made up of 12 sections and seven annexes. The sections deal with such as funding, information sharing, and the transfer of the annexes are supporting documents that are added to the individual agreement that have additional information. This presentation is a summary of the individual agreement. The full document can be found on the website. So let's get started. Section is interpretation. This section is used for the two cases used in the individual agreement. It guides the reader on how to understand the individual agreement. 
clarifies that for the First Nation reserve lands that the land will be listed in the next G, which include Columbus, Port of Sins, Maine, which also includes Francois, Mixed Definition, and Lose Lake, as well as Kent, Snake. Remember, section two is information. This section states that can provide information to for the First Nation about any leases, permits, or other interests or rights given for the Indian Act. This information can be found in the Rex C. Canada will also provide the information about the condition of the reserve of the environment. This is found in the Rex D. And any that um, affects any of the lands is found in the next year. Section three is the transfer of the land administration. This section describes the transfer of two forms in First Nation for the control of the reserve lands and natural resources. There is this territory to vote and the inverse of freedom. Or also first information will use its reserve lands and resources according to the um, note though that the Indian will still apply. Section four is the acceptance of transfer and uh, acceptance of transfer. Section four is the acceptance of transfer of the administration. This section states that the land will become the land of the Oaks and First Nation Reserve. The 44 land management provisions of the Indian Act will no longer apply. And the is responsible for issues that occurred before the land was in force, and for and First Nation is responsible for land decisions and activities that have been Section can nation with according to the chart that's found in a Canada will provide for this first nation with an additional funding to support the transfer of the women's administration. This funding is periodically reviewed by all First Nations that are operating under an independent. Section six is transfer. This section states that Canada agrees to provide Florence and First Nation with all the capital and communities that Canada has held and controlled on behalf of Florence and First Nation. The amounts in these accounts are listed in Annex B. Section seven is notes to third degrees of transfer of administration. This states that Florence and First Nation will of the legal convenient force to companies that are already doing business on reserve lands. The companies that must be notified are listed in Annex C. Section 8 is the internal assessment process. So, projects on reserve lands will have an internal assessment process until Fortnite's and First Nation has developed their own process of the law. The internal process is in an mix F. Section This section states that the individual agreement can only be changed if Ornels and First Nation and Canada agree in writing to make the changes. Section 10 notice between ways. When communicating with each other, Canada and Council uh, will agree to do it in writing and follow the terms of the individual agreement. Section 11 is dispute resolution. This section states that any disputes related to the individual agreement can be dealt with using the process described in the French agreement on First Nation movement. The options include negotiation, mediation, neutral evaluation, and arbitration. And finally, section 12 is the date of government force. This uh, agreement can only apply to reserve lands if it is approved by a yes vote by Columbus and First Nation members and signed by Canada and the Council. The 
individual images will come to force at the same time as the land group, which is the first day of the month following certification of the vote. So that's a quick run through what the individual agreement has in it. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'm there at joey.garnish at nation.ca or see the website www.nation.com. Thank you. So with um, these meetings, there's two more when, when it comes to the land code document. One is a, a more thorough summary, and then another one is literally line by line of the land code document that goes through it and say in plain language what each section means. It's really important in that, you know, all the information is kind of spent. It's accessible, it's understandable. Yeah, I want to be questions because I don't want any um, misinformation out there. So the website I think is a really great resource to uh, find out what kind of questions you have. Uh, a couple of key things that I would like to speak to before introducing um, how I'm going to be. It's important to remember that land code only applies to reserve lands, it does not apply to the territory, it does not affect any of your treaty rights. Um, just because there's space for something in the land code, for example, I mentioned uh, justice of the peace. So there's space for justice of the peace, but in the 25 years, there's only been one instance where a nation actually just used a justice of peace. No nation has appointed one. Um, so just because there's space for something doesn't mean that it has to happen. That's one of the beautiful things about Nike because it's tailored to each nation. Um, you know, Fort Nelson's really lucky because there's a, there's a large land base here. Right, you're just in the Fraser Valley, and there's other nations that have, you know, 60 acres, and that's their entire reserve, and and their operational um, underlying goals. Yeah. So, yeah, I would like to introduce Jackie Brown. Uh, he is with the Land Development Board and Resource Center. He'll be able to probably answer questions more thoroughly than I can, as well as uh, speak to references of other nations and what they've done in specific instances. And then Al Gross is the independent verifier. So he is the one that verified that the line code document is in line with Frank Kernick, and he will be the one to verify that the voting procedure is in line with the community ratification process. So, is there anything you want to speak to? Uh, certainly. Yeah. Um, how many other? Thank you. Thank you. And good sign. Uh, how many other? So, good evening and good sign. My good sign name is Guy Yves. My common name is Jack Brown. And I'd just like to acknowledge the community in, in, in our way. Sing the Gap, Sing about all the not only would I like to acknowledge your uh, elected chief council, but also your resident chiefs, your matriarch shareholders, and your community as a whole. It is a real honor to be here tonight, uh, to be sitting with you as leaders and in your beautiful community and lands uh, of Nelson First Nation. Um, again, I'm here to provide any, any answers to your questions you have online for the agreement, maybe to the process itself. Um, uh, I've been with the First Central Land Mines and Resource Center of the six years this November, um, the day after the members day, to be exact. And previous to that, I was with the province of BC as a First Central's senior manager, the Ministry of Forest and Hence Natural Resource Operations in the building. So today, I was there for just over three years. And prior to that, I was only today for Central and Forest Shore as a forestry coordinator 
um, for seven years. And prior to that, uh, in the forestry field, I was a forestry commission, doing forestry consultant for eight years. Uh, again, we used to open kids at first station in the community of my soil, present day history. Uh, and my wife and children work in one hand in my families within the Michigan Nation and the United Nation to, to get that information and look at her there in the Carrier's area. But uh, we moved to French Georgia in 2006 and French Georgia um, up until then. But again, I'm here to join you answer any questions you may have in the lab board, folks in South and going forward. I think one thing I'd like to really quick is. Um, Given that Fort Nelson First Nation, we feel very confident that you have a promissory land board. And one of the first steps that would we'll take place after your promissory land board is setting up your land committee that is made up of Fort Nelson First Nation leadership. That would work not only with your community potentially in your last department, but also with your leadership, um, making those decisions by Fort Nelson First Nation and for Fort Nelson First Nation leadership. That's, that's one of the key aspects of your potential of your land policing. Is developing these laws that make sense for parents in this future. And that's that's one of the key aspects of the uniqueness that they have, as Jody mentioned very eloquently in his videos, um, going forward. It's really, really key going forward. Mm -hmm. Coming up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just to put a quick comment, I could summarize my, uh, summarize my role easily. Uh, I'm independent, as uh, Jody has indicated. That means I don't have a, a relationship, reporting relationship to First Nation, to the lab, to the board, or to Cam. My job is to verify certain aspects of this process. One thing is to confirm that the community ratification process, that's the process you use to ratify your code and your and, and through the individual agreement consistent with legislation. To confirm that the code is consistent with legislation. Legislation is one of the public primary I turn down and I issue a certificate a sworn certificate saying that that is consistent. You have that. The other uh, role I have is to certify your code if the people approve it. And I issue a certificate for that. And once it's certified, it becomes your law. It becomes your law. And the third role I have is to arbitrate disputes between the First Nation and Canada, if there are any. And I have to say that well, I've done 40 or 50 of these files. I have not arbitrated anything. And yet, if Canada and the First Nation work together and how it came to a revolution, and the only action you have is how you do things. Because Canada is here, they won't do it. The First Nation wanted to have a lab in the middle, and Jack and the Department of Health, which is the source of the stuff. This finally did to finish the agreement. In this case, you have the agreements, they've been issued by your chief, the uh, at the one with Cam, and see it been agreement from the chief issued by. Uh, Canada, so you've already reached that level. So it's just a matter of the vote. And when I, the vote, I'll confirm that the vote was conducted consistent with the rules that the council approved, and those rules are called the community ratification process. And uh, I'm honored to be here. I love these files because, in the end, there's, a, there's an achievement, a great achievement. It's why I'm creating so great. <laughs> so, uh, well, and so I'm going to totally defend it. Sign on when I certify the file, you got your law, you got your management, and uh, I I close my file. That's it for me. I'm not around for the, for the administration. <laughs> yes, just to add really quick, other administrations have it. Uh, operational organizations right now. Yeah. Not one First Nation wants to go back to their community boards of the state with this. not one First Nation. That that should be that's not an option. Uh not not I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well doesn't the Indian Act 
Plus any sorry bad. Doesn't any not protect us to Indians? Well, as of now, you want to do anything in relation to development, you have to go to the federal government to get that permission as of now, before land, because you're not land code as of now. But if you pass your land code, or Nelson First Nation is able to make those decisions at the speed of business that are the best interests of Fort Nelson in this membership going forward. So, uh, well, actually, um, that only take an individual to protect, protect his land, and he has been done to what he said, turn it down. Right? Well, there is some things that are uh, issue with. Like, uh, Who's who's controls it? This board, this land board that we, that is being implemented. Because there's a bunch of numbers that they said in 2014, 2006. So I'm mindful of the numbers and talk about different nations. Yeah, it's kind of confused where. Where so reserve land, Fort Nelson First Nation would be managing those reserve lands and not Canada. Like on your behalf, in the nation that has been seeking council, or is it the lands department? Is it a few car? Or who's who's, who's going to is it capital works? Who's going to? So chief and council would, would delegate to like the lands and director, and then there would be. Um, a lens committee made up of you know younger, older, uh, elders, staff, mix, mix of members to be a part of the land committee, and they would all work together to to that. So, if I could add to that, there's um, a lot of work that has to take place if the land code is a yes vote. So the work actually really begins once we get a yes vote because there's so much um, planning, land use planning, policy making, bylaw, what, what kind of structure do we want the administration to happen? So if we were to have a yes vote, then the work would begin. Then the community would be engaged in, in the land use plan. Uh, where in the reserve, territory or the reserve lands, do we want to have industrial, residential, maybe even um, band members being able to build their own homes in a certain area. So the, the nation members would be involved in all of that planning. So the yes vote gets us away from having in the Indian Act and the government managing reserve lands and telling us how we can use them to us having the authority to say, we want industrial areas, maybe down in gravel, wherever it is. Um, but the engagement side would begin in January. And the lands committee uh, recommendation would go out to the community. Do you want to make these decisions by a land advisory board? Or do you want to have heads of families? Like it could become part of the nationhood project where the community members and the family members determine who represents them at that table to make sure that there's Denny, there's Cree, there's elders, there's youth, there's business people, there's everybody at the table to make sure that we're protecting our lands. Because if we look at some of them, we had an assessment done on the whole resort of all the lands that were um, There's some lands behind uh, the gravel pit that's damaged and that's been reported in the environmental assessment and it's up to the government to fix that. It's not to us, but it's up to the government to fix that while it's land for this We can say, you know, we want to use that land, we want to clean up, but they will do it at their cost. We might take them to work, but it would be at their cost. So there's, there's lots of uh, work that needs to be done, but um, the first step is getting jurisdictional. Mm -hmm. After the funding is still available for cleaning. Yeah. So, so I don't want somebody to think how it's the first nation's place. Right. 
funding is still it. Well, it's, just, the, it's just the first nation that I've been crafting with to get it enough done. The, all, what will we'll always remain is that fiduciary duty of federal government to being there for the first nation to work together. The decision is more land management, land first nation. There are certain plans. And in in land code, like each and every single proposed land pop requests a loan and review. So operating under land code effectively removes Canada's seat at the table of reserve lands and resources and gives a voice to the members where they're currently in one. And I think that's a it's a really important thing for the first nation members. It's, it's, it's the members that know what's best for this land, for this area, for the, for, for these people. It's not Canada. Right now, Canada has the final say in, in things that they shouldn't have. So voting yes for land for is Canada's final say. And it, and it, it really transfers um, a voice to Fort Nelson First Nation members. Yeah, the problem of our leaders are not in favor of our membership as well. It's just... Great. So, yeah, this is a journey where is it, there's an understanding of, of what land code means, but actually, maybe the Fort Nelson is a different place to have those questions more than we could all accept that. Is there any questions online? We just asked, nothing else. Maybe you can touch on uh, when we sign over the government's going to give us our money. That settlement and trust for the nation. Um, what's happened there? The money comes to us, the nation the elected council will receive monies, uh, how it's allocated. And is there any more funding from the government that is uh, other than the transaction, transaction 150? Is that a one time fee or is that no, year? Yeah, so when it comes to money, um, underlying code, like Core, core funding is still received every year. It has nothing to do with core funding. It has nothing to do with uh, programs that are applied for for funding. It is a totally separate thing. Uh, right now, Canada has in in their possession uh, roughly $10 million in two accounts that the nation kind of has to beg to use when they, when they need it. Uh, under land code because it's it's historical lands related revenues, that money actually would get transferred to the nation. Now, so that's one part. Another part is your operation. So when it comes to that, there's two parts. For the first two years, um, currently it's 75,000, but it's actually by the time, if this is the FO, by the time it's actually in a, in a bid, it would be $100,000 so 200,000 and then I think it's 341,000 roughly each year to to fund the, the role for the lens firm and everything that is involved with with building that branch of the government of Fort Nelson First Nation so so that's ongoing uh the 340 some thousand and each Basically, as more and more nations join into the framework agreement, it really gives the um, land valuable mortgage to ask for more. So just just this year, it's a twenty one percent increase over the previous five year agreement. Um, so that so it it's fine. So just on the um, the money that gets transferred. To to be clear, because that's a lot of money. Ten million is a lot of money, but it's also money that can be easily spent if there's no savings. Mm -hmm. So right now we're working on a um, own source revenue capital review policy that will determine how the nation can access that money once it's transferred. It's not like it's transferred and all of a sudden ten million spend. There would be some guidelines and preparing budgets, getting community approval, that sort of thing to access that. Need. So it doesn't need to change the way we access it. 
We actually want to build a cultural center and we need to take on the community. The community can make that decision. So it, it's easier to access for the things that we need it for. And we're willing to ask anybody. We ask our community members according to the policy, we can distribute that into a company. <laughs> whatever it is that the community wants. But right now, um, any money that we access through Ottawa people that can move in, it has to go through a process. We have made it, we have it. And I, for me, as an Indigenous person, I do not like to go to the government to ask for anything to be approved when it's already used. <laughs> so I think in that aspect, but as long as we have some good policy around accessing that money and how we budget and plan for the future of that money. Also, the 340000 that would come through in January, that money would be used for development, determining how we're going to um, resource the, the lands department, whether it's going to be a coordinator, a manager, a researcher, some legal teams, because there's a lot of things to happen. And uh, it's going to cost money to put that plan together. Um, I would say that the first year or two is just fun. Funding on how you're going to use your reserve, how you're going to build, build on your reserve, um, what kind of policies you need. Do we need bylaws? Right now, our bylaws are not enforceable by the government. If we have land laws, they are enforceable. They are going to be enforceable because they're land laws on your nation. Where the bylaws, you can pull the place 200 times in one night, and they're not going to come out because they're they have not we have no uh, legal jurisdiction. So when we talk about um, you know laws and violence that we need in our community or policy that makes our community safe, we can develop those laws as a team, develop them as a community that wants a safe space for our children. And who do we want to live in the community? You know, do they have to pass a citizenship code to live in this community? Because I think we, we all know what we're talking about, what I'm talking about here. And I think if we had jurisdiction over our reserve and who can live here and how we're going to use that land, then then we'll be able to enforce some some policies. Or right. some land laws. Right. So just a question here, and it's probably not everybody was this including the Ottawa Trust. The agricultural benefits, all that, all will come transferred. Yeah. No, 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 not that cows and cows. No, that money stays there. That's treaty. We're treaty. Yeah. Okay. So the the Ottawa Trust, all the capital funding, all the revenue. Yeah. So capital funding, that's the Ottawa Trust. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Okay. And just to add to Leslie's example. Um, you could develop a community quality and protection law, for example, right? Where it's decided on by four Nelson First Nation members. Um, how is it you want to maintain the quality of your community going forward? And is there a training opportunity for an enforcement officer, say, that is four Nelson First Nation wing, right? You can do it completely in house, and you still have that application of the RCP if need be. But really, it's up to four days first nation of where where is it going to really work on your ship? Knowing the unique relationships and values you have here, that is going to be a dignified approach of dealing with issues, right? Right? Whereas you know the RCP piece, you hope you don't have to get to that. Yeah. This is my is, is where I'm getting to it for the end game say in relation to law development, right? Um, again, having an enforcement officer, maybe a lands officer, mm -hmm. Leslie, uh, for the lands department going forward. I mean, what would make more sense for the first nation and its membership? You would make that decision. That law development. So, would this be an integration to the actual lands department now, or would it be a separate from the lands department? Because they control yeah. all reserve. But I think the plan has always been that the land code was managed under the leadership of the lands department. Right now it's under corporate services, but it will be, if we get a yes vote, it will be transitioned over to the lands department. And one of the reasons I really like that is because um, when we talk about territory and how we work with the Ministry of Forests or the Ministry of Environment and the Poverty, 
we have to apply by the but if we have really good environmental policies of the way we look at our plan, then we're expecting it. We're going to say we have these policies for environment, for water, for um, forestry management, for road development, for whatever it is. We have these good policies that we manage our land, our reserve lands. We expect them because we raise the standard. And we expect you to at least meet that, right? So I think you have more leverage when you're dealing with um, territory, you're dealing with the Ministry of Forest or watersheds or. Isn't um, the land department uh, funded by the one gas commission? Well, that's that's a bit, that's territory. That's uh. But when they fund it, do they fund it? Through that, and so. So, which is a government. The resource managers? The uh, OGC. Oh, oh the, yes. government, the government. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something. Yeah. So yeah. it, really, it really opens the avenue of, of as let's mm -hmm. get talking. What's that negotiation now look like going forward? There are principles that you can apply from your land code outside of your territory, right? which would include the provincial government, uh, municipal government, or regional district government, and proponents. Mm -hmm. There may be proponents there that you that you potentially need to work with. But there are principles within land code that you could develop and apply going forward. Right? Or so we're trying to get away the private. Now, being directed by the provincial is uh, really that, that depends again in terms of negotiation, right? That like, where's the give and take between the conversation between Port Nelson for Nation's leadership and its legal counsel, its interest in its membership going forward, right? You don't necessarily get a one way street, it's not a one way street, it won't be. You're not. Well, it's like you can develop that that aspect of hey, look, we want more than here at the and you can build up on the territory and then like reserve and it did absolutely who's in control in this and now it says that yeah, that it's gonna be it's the hands of the department, but it's funded you see. No, no. No. The territory, the current lands department, there, that's where there's some miscommunication because land code, lands department, two very different things. That's what I was getting at. So let's ensure when we speak about it, we talk about land committee, lands code, everything's land code, not just lands. Yeah. Because when it's, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, isn't it just, just it's, sad that there was going to be kind of the yeah. 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 It'll be a division. No. 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 The land code coordinator, their office would be in the lands building, mm. still separate because land code applies to within reserve boundaries. It does not apply outside of reserve boundaries, which is the territory of the board that in house yeah. as well. If you got a office or sleeping in the same bed. Well, I think one of the things, uh, oh. yeah, one of the things with the land code department is they need somebody to report to you, right? And um, they could stay under corporate services, but the plan has always been that they would be transferred, transitioned over to transfer over to basically for administration, but they would operate under two different policies. You would have the land policies and then you have your territory land. Um, administratively, that have the same administration policies that you would have to follow, follow. reporting, uh, budgets, all those types of things. But the land code would be independent, but they need somebody to report to, so they would report to the land director. It's just the space where the office were would have it. It's but, but, okay, there's a big but, because they could, if the community members said, we don't want the land code to operate with the lands department because maybe because we are funded by the OGC. We want them to operate under corporate services or another department or the OGC. It's up to the community to decide what that looks like. 
and what makes most sense to to the bank. But that in the agreement, it was always identified that they would be under the bank. Yes, one question. I know that the property van there, blueberry, all the entire Angle Ridge do all the work for them because they don't have the truck to do all everything. So they have them to do all the work. They need them the money. What they owe, and there's uh, nobody, uh, I don't know how to say it, but and they do all the work. So, sorry, was there? So, who would we, who would the nation get to do the work on reserves? <laughs> well, good. I just wanted to see, uh, I know I tried to get a travel kit before, and I couldn't get it. On reserve, on um, reserve, off reserve. So again, I'm going to have you got to have one mm -hmm. if you're somebody to all it for you, or else you can't get it. So speaking of gravel pit, for the last five years, there's been red tape, bureaucracy for the, the gravel pit to get its permit. It's just Finally, now been approved and they're finalizing finalizing that. Um, and what that's resulted in is hundreds of thousands of dollars of lost revenue over the last five years and employment opportunities. Um, had Port Nelson First Nation been operating under land code, it wouldn't be a five-year process to get a permit because it's done in house. Because because gravel pits on reserve, so it's it's the land code department that would um, authorize the permit. So he mentioned the speed of business, doing doing things at the speed of business. That's because everything we've done in house was best for the nation, not not a five year long drawn out thing that does end up passing, but it costs the nation hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Garcia has got their own gravel pit. Ricky Saga. They, they don't have a handful or anything. They're just wanting to get to them. And it's, that, that's the problem because our nation has a gravel pit, which is obsolete, and they're all gravel there every other time that people are, are going to do something with this. But you know, Ricky Saga has got creators running around reserve, but for Jackson Bennett has its own equipment, which is you know, based on four thousand per case, and this kind of conflicting. Yeah. And you know, it, how how is how are we writing have to write under somebody with water rights, and they're writing our bill or they're signing our bills? Like I, I've seen it. Um, you know, as radar road transport, it's got more water rates than our nation. <laughs> that's kind of slap in the face where they're signing all these books. And then they're kind of easy, like, it's kind of different. I don't know if it's experience. Is it a bad plan? Which is for, we're already losing. I'm not what uh, like my hundred percent sure of all the um policies or rules around how we operate on the gravel pit. And that's probably you know that's something about okay, that's land food related because it's in on the reason. So does this group or this the members, how do they want to deal with that? Because that's Land related issues that we want to look at. Right now, I believe um, it is being managed by our business side. So, does, does the community still want that to happen? When you sign your land code, we start talking about land use plans. That gravel pit has it been when's the last time it was measured, 
right? When is the last time it was quantified how much that land it was? It should have been just one. So, so if, uh, you know, when it comes to the land, to the gravel, that's where some real solid decisions and policy around how that gravel thing is managed and, managed and how much value is in it. I think so. So what's the land holdings guidelines around how you access that ground and who's the one that's signing off on the gravel that's leaving it? Who how do they how do they get the permits to, to access them? How big do we want that permit to be? And how are we going to reclaim the land? There's no reclamation plan right now with that right now. Mm -hmm. So I think with the land you can develop those, those work plans and those policies and those management uh, guidelines. So I think for that purpose alone, it's been beneficial for uh, a land group to start making those decisions. I thought that the van, the ground fit there, right when you started, it could be on all the way down as far as it can go. And that's very, as Joey mentioned, it's very onerous, right? And it's it's process. It's very, very I'm working on the day. We're not just young, but we're trying to make it all. Your process is all inside. Yeah, we have green coming out of the way. Yeah, I mean, you can develop a process to make that important enough and still maintain that environmental standard and process. Of transparency and accountability for all Nelson's members. But it's the business part of it's making it make profile, making it difficult when we're just out of question making. There's uh there's that money going to a drone and they're measuring this and measuring that, but they they can't be over here doing this, they're worried about tree plant over there and picking one scale. It's a different uh, it's, uh, it's, uh but it's still all and it's um I think um uh, you know, with the, the gravel pit um with setting up data that had to separate the nation politics with uh, business entities. So that's what data is. Uh data like there's like 13 entities underneath it, like Port Hotel, Lodge, all gravel pits. There was um Right, oh, neglect on people are in power back to 2018 to let the permits expire. But since then, they got them uh, renewed, and it was a process going to uh, ISC to get it done because it all is on reserve land. But it, it was a little longer process. I think uh, it took a little longer because we were lack of uh, funds and manpower to do it. But it, it, I, I own gravel pits, so it's not a hard process. If you have the right people to do it, it's actually very streamlined. So, but that's where it's it's back on track now. The government gets for every cubic meter of gravel leaves there, they get three dollars and fifty cents. So they want to see gravel leave. If they're gravel leaving without the permits in place, and then we're actually doing something illegal. But it's it's, it's done right now. To so, uh, proper people in charge. Um, but what we're going to look back to, maybe you guys can explain a bit more on our, uh, when land goal gets passed, you know, the, the vote goes through, it's going to go through a leadership uh, committee, full leadership committee. So, if I understood that right, that's, it will, we have to implement, first thing is implement a committee that will oversee the transition in, and then from there, they will stay in power and watch it. Is that how it works? Yeah. Maybe you can explain that It's at both leadership and the lands committee. And your lands committee, you can develop the terms of reference for, for your committee members. Yeah. Uh, do you want to appoint? Do you want to elect them? How long is the term of the yeah, so committee members? It would be entirely up for the must. I will look up those things forward. Yeah. And we have samples for that to provide as assistance. You know, I know charge, right? We, we, the RC does not charge our nations anything for what we provide for assistance. We, we are there as a resource. Yeah. Standard, just as the name says, that to provide that uh, support to yeah. nations to develop their life 
transition, if they pass transition and we become operational, we are still there, right? Uh, what would make most sense for producing First Nation is membership, uh, what that land community looks like. You develop that, we can provide samples and you can shape it to where yeah. it makes sense yeah. on the Can you uh, design a bird chart? I'm just really explaining that. So when people look at it, they'll say, okay, we're starting here, it passes, and then we're going to go this way, and it's going to work down. Certainly. Yep. And that's where people will follow it. You know, one of my people questioned me, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't understand it. So and that's what we're meeting the first one of the main companies. Everybody needs understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So sections five and six of the plan document speaks to what the landfill office and the landfill team looks like. So it's it's um, in the document. Um, let's see. So if you want, I can speak directly to what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so land rules. Council may by council resolution delegate land related authorities other than an unclean land laws to the lands director. It's the lands director who will then by staff positions in the land code office, including employees, contractors, volunteers, or other persons considered to be land code office staff to implement the land code and land laws. The lands director may also do the following with respect to any land code office staff position. They can delegate land related authorities other than an acting land laws for that staff position. They can specify whether that staff position includes the authority to register land instruments in First Nation Lands Register. And then, subject to the terms of any council resolution, the duties of the land office include developing draft land laws, advising council the lands, and the lands committee on land laws and land policies, advising council on administrative fees, rent, fees, and other amounts in respective lands. Arranging lands meetings and votes in accordance with this land code. Proposing to cancel the annual lands work plan and lands budget. Providing input on Fort Nelson First Nations annual reports in respect to land revenues and land activities. If applicable, assisting the lands committee upon request and managing and maintaining systems for land administration, such as record keeping, data management, and the development of approved forms and procedures. In carrying out its responsibilities, and uh, if the lands committee has been established, the land code office must consider any advice provided by the lands committee. Now, the lands committee, council may establish a lands committee. Um, council must, by council resolution, appoint all members of the lands committee. Members of the lands committee must be appointed to serve a three-year term, which which the term can be renewed. Uh, by council from time to time. I want to ensure that there are always at least five members on the lands committee. Council must establish the terms of re reference for the lands committee regarding the committee composition, eligibility, remuneration of members, and any similar matters. Uh, in addition to the functions of the lands committee under this land code, the lands committee may advise council and the lands office on the following. Land related matters, including the granting of interests and licenses, land use plans, land related policies and land laws, and recommendations from members and others regarding lands and environment concerns and priorities. Council may, by council resolution, delegate land related authorities, other than enacting land laws, to the lands committee, including authority related to particular land projects, developments, or activities. Council may terminate the appointment of any member of the Lands Committee who fails to attend three consecutive meetings of the Lands Committee without the approval of the chair, undertake their duties as a member of the Lands Committee under this land code, or comply with the terms of reference or any code of conduct for the Lands Committee. So that's, that's what the land code document says about the land rules and so. So chief and council will, will um, appoint five members 
the, the terms of reference will decide what that actually looks like. Uh, does it have to have one elder? Does it have to, right? All of those decisions, like Leslie said, once, once it's a guess vote, that's when the work begins because we've got to figure out what is best for the nation. Um, that's when the engagement begins. Do, do, the, do the members want to make sure that there's at least one elder on this committee or not? Um, so, so there's chief and council, the lands director, and the committee. So there's the three kind of checks and balances to make sure that the land code document is implemented properly. Mm -hmm. So that it's not just one person in power. And, and in the land code document, uh, there's conflict of interest rules, which currently aren't under the Indian Act. So if, if chief and council have a conflict of interest, in a, uh, an issue that they're deliberating on, that would actually go to the membership for a vote if there's conflict of interest with chief and council. Um, a conflict of interest is if somebody's going to personally benefit from something in a decision that they need. So that's a really important thing. But again, it's a voice to the members where there currently isn't one. That's just one aspect of the accountability and transparency of your own. Okay. Are there any questions online? Did you answer you answered it? You were answering it when she sent a question. What was the question? Oh, there was a conversation over uh, the other. It was basically what you just said. Exactly. What you said. So again, in um, on the website, there's a 58 minute long video where I literally go through the land code document line by line. I, I highly recommend going and going and checking them. Right? That that's probably going to answer a lot of questions and bring up a lot of questions. So please don't hesitate to to go and warn yourself and reach out with your questions. The other thing you have to look forward to is uh, a huge document. <laughs> So we're doing a, a mail of uh, the individual agreement, the framework agreement, the land code summaries, maps, like all that kind of stuff, the access to points for the um, work page. So it's going to be door to door delivery and then uh, emails. If anybody wants an email document, they're all on the website. Uh, all nation members or urban members will get um, it mailed directly to them so that everybody can, if you want to read the big documents, it's there, or you can just read the summary. And it summarizes key points in each of the documents. But that will be um, out to your mailboxes within the next week or so. Um, the first vote is November 27th. The final vote is December 7th. So December 8th, we'll be very we have so we moving forward. I encourage everybody to share the, this information with your families, um, really getting the information uh, accurate, accurate to yourself and that you feel, you feel good about the decision that you're making. And because it's not only that we're making this decision for us today, but the little kids that are more raising. And I think that's key, is that the environment, the watershed, the way we treat our neighbors has to be And we have to have to say, not um, not the Department of Interference. Those days are over. So I think about jurisdiction, um, working in, in government, jurisdiction issues around health, child, child welfare, education. Everybody is going after jurisdiction of running communities the way they see fit. Housing, that's a big one. Um, so it only makes sense to, if you're going to have jurisdiction over education, child welfare, housing, and your health, that you have jurisdiction over your lives. Then it's holistic. It's a complete approach of managing your, your nation for your community. Well, thank you. She made the writing is a little bigger. <laughs> that's my fault. I am. I just did an automation work and I need to make it small to fit in my carrier. But I just look at the website as well. All of that is on the website. Zoom in. 
You got to be able to assume me. Yeah, you want to look at your thing, you're going to have back in the middle of the year. I know where all the black is, everything about it. There's also a elder selection on October 18th um, for the elders. We'll have a small group session, um, bigger print. <laughs> we have another community engagement session on November 16th. And then Every Tuesday is Talk Line Code Tuesday at seven o'clock on Zoom for anybody that wants to join in. Mm -hmm. And there's a, we call it youth, but it's um, 18 to 30. So uh, engagement session for the youth on uh, um, yeah. the 30th to the 3rd, October 30th to the 3rd, And the thing about it is every time you participate, Mm -hmm. You're eligible for the grand prize. So we have prizes at every one of our engagement sessions, but then we have a grand prize. So, like, there's she, she, someone, she. There's a lot. Joe, do you have a question? Um, I just want to go back to the line coach in the community that have a physical line coach you that is referenced. Of what it could look like. Well, uh, the land code document has already been verified, and it there's a hundred and roughly uh, other nations land codes on the Lab RC website. Um, Joy River actually just signed theirs. Is the uh, the lab uh, website on the land code page? No. Is there a link? No. Oh, okay. It's yeah. It's uh, I didn't I didn't want to mess it up. The... So we just can go there and yeah. I know I've seen it before. It's the LR So the vast majority of the individual land codes were taken from a template and then tailored to each community. So like the sections are the same, but then wording is different because you're able to tailor it to your traditions, to your cultures, to, to your lands. Um, and of course those, uh, those documents have Stood the test of time with numerous, numerous, numerous First Nation legal uh, input. Um, this one here, ours, has received legal input as well. Um, as I mentioned, there is a number of, of staff community members that have, over the last number of years, seven ish years, developed this land code. And I just wanted to add that the Port Nelson First Nation Land Code is, is on is the latest kind of land code, along with the First Nation, more the simplistic language for its membership to really understand what it means. Some of the older languages that we've alluded to, there's a lot, a lot of legal reason in that, a lot of cross referencing, it just becomes very, very difficult for our nations over time to really understand. So within the last year and a half, nearly two years, uh, here in BC, we've taken, we've taken the lab code really simplified, still all that weight and strength of belief um, of effectiveness going forward to, to be that law for the First Nation. Going to the First Nation would be your neighbor nation that has their life, which just hasn't just, June fifteenth of this year, they passed the line. Uh, of the two hundred and twenty-six members that were eighteen years of age and up, one hundred voters came out, and ninety-nine of them said yes. And one online vote and said so. It was ninety-nine mm -hmm. percent. They don't their station. So that would be one that probably easily their nation would like see their line told and what it, what it is to them going forward. And their land code is on their website. Yeah, DRFN. Yeah, going reverse. 
Woodland Creek, they just passed theirs last year, so that would be something to look at their you know, website and mm -hmm. when I vote and see what with them, you know, what is the main thing you know, to get our community to bring in prosperity, opportunity. Yeah, the new people are saying it is an evolution uh, that has to learn for a couple years. So, over car. Or also, for nation, is probably one. Yeah, for Hector. Just mission one and two, eight, here. Maybe. No. Like 9,600 hectares or something? Yeah, I think it is almost 24,000 hectares. 24,000? Mm -hmm. Under 1,000 hectare. What's that? Fort Nelson, Fort Nelson, the community? This, no, the Fort Nelson First Nation? First Nation. Um, oh, it's like 94. Yeah, yeah. 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 which is like 24,000. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's um, sizable, yeah. sizable reserve. The two maps that are over on the wall there, I like the maps, and we got the maps from the um, but um, the green map shows uh, the Treaty 8 boundary, and then where Fort Nelson considers their boundary to be is between Trach and Pink Mountain. And then the Northeast, that's kind of like the Fort Nelson and traditional territory. And then the other shows all the um, traditional sites, and anything that's highlighted in pink is. Even at some part of Yeah. What's that? It's not island because it's not it's not a company said it's a good that chief but it's not and that's where there's three three uh different specifications. So there's the Treaty 8 territory, and then there's the Fort Nelson, but they consider it the they took one French considers to be Indian rivers. And then we have our own traditions. The other map shows the traditional sites that we recognize as being where we come from. Sorry where everybody comes from. Um but the government has the and that's what the land flow would be covering would be anything in pink. So can we fight the Indigenous Service Canada or whatever it's called? Uh, oh, sorry about that. To, uh, because there's a couple places that, not a couple, there's more than a couple places that we want to designate it as uh, the new reserve. Um, there's the we... chance to reserve process. It's like a, it's a, Heck of a, yeah, because there's an addition. Like a 59 page document that yeah. so it, so if the if if Works First Nation took on an addition to reserve and Nelson Forks did do become a reserve, then Land Code would would apply to that space as well. Going forward. Yeah, yeah. But if you were to change the name so they could log there, you know. Can you yeah. stop that before he began to sell Deer River? Well, change makes the damage in the sandy lake. So, I saw another. So, when you talk land, like I, it burns me when I look at the McSamish Lake and the four little spots they got on there that's identified as reserved lands. I go, that whole territory is Fort Nelson First Nation, right? <laughs> but they have four, I don't know, about 26 acres. Same as the old fort. Well, according to the government, where, you know, when we talk about five acres in West Park, there's four actually. <laughs> It's a famous lake side. Yeah. It's where they used to walk the yard. There's Sandy Creek over there. 
Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add, we, I think you mentioned about the 59 page APR, I disagree with sort of what was that? Uh, as of now, the advisory board and its directors are looking at that process with this of uh, going to 59 pages and similar to the land code. Let's, let's simplify that down mm -hmm. and really get that process streamlined in a way of the interest of the first vision or what that ATR should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not going to be this five, eight, ten year process anymore. It's going to be they want to at least cut that thing in half or even quarter of that process to really expedite the process. Even the name ATR itself is there's consideration of changing it, right? Is that um, all the line? Um... Well, ideally, the federal government is trying to divest itself of, of governance, right? Like really, when you look at that whole Indian Act, not only is it our Act, but it's just it's a collateral consulting, right? We know that. So again, it's just an example of the <laughs> advisory board trying to take that process and this is a profile of that. So is there a deadline? Which Morgan just said is the final attempt at it. Is this actually the final? No, that would be up to the First Nation. That's what you're you, if, if the vote was to not pass, there's opportunity there for yet again. Yeah. You should have appetite and community's appetite to sit it again. And because, I mean, it'd be nice if I, well, I, I'm going to give you a book, but not everybody is uh, just understanding it all. And, you know, just the more engagement that we have, the more understanding people will have and maybe the time. It will be a podcast, but to you know, well, and again, on um, the first vote, yeah. it was a was pretty much yeah. more people were in favor than against. Okay. So there was that second uh, okay. unfair ritual that stopped. Exactly. It, it kind of makes sense, though, that the simple majority. Policy is in place because that's the policy we need for approving policy. <laughs> yeah. the policy or decisions that we're making is always simple majority. Because if you look at, I think there's folks who are 680 or something that eligible voters, we would never ever get 50% of the eligible voters voting. Mm -hmm. You know what? In election time, we might get 30. Yeah. yeah. So if we didn't have simple majority, we wouldn't only take any decisions. So I think for majority that was one, we have any mm -hmm. So we've got good meetings like this to educate, educate yourself and uh, everybody will come to the decision. The other thing too is if your family if your family doesn't want to come out to a meeting like this, phone us. We'll come see you if you if you're comfortable having us come and present, or if you want to come to the band office and have a and we can go through the same presentation and if there any questions that you might have. Um, between now and November 30th, we're going to be doing one of the meetings or family meetings or smaller group sessions if anybody's interested. Any other questions? Who wins the prizes? <laughs> I think that the rocks, you guys took the names? Yeah, so we got 31 uh, listed. We entered. So we got a lot of fun. So, so Morgan must be disinformed and she's saying that's our final attempt. That's not the finish. No, people. They just heard what he just said. Oh, I see. Also, if everybody gets ready, everybody just like to come out and share this. Look in your mailbox so that it's very happy that you didn't want to go to the meeting. Um, and then also share it with your family. Share it with your family. Give us a call. We're more than willing to share the information. and. Thank you.